Hi everyone. Today I want to talk about a topic near and dear to my heart, and that is something called levity polymorphism. Um, and the reason it's near and dear to my heart is because uh, um, uh, Simon P.J. and I wrote a paper on levity polymorphism together some years ago. It was a very fun collaboration. There's some very cool stuff that came out of it. Um, and, and so let's let's dive in now. By the way, you're not supposed to know what levity means, and and maybe not even polymorphism. And, and we'll we'll explore that in in the video. I think it's it's all going to become okay. And actually, the name levity polymorphism is is kind of a bad name anyway. We'll we'll see why. So this is the the file that we're working in. Um, uh, there's a link to it in the uh, video description. The file that we're working in is actually a continuation of of the of last week's video on unbox types. Um, so if you, if you didn't catch last week's video, that might be helpful to just sort of see what's going on here and, and sort of to motivate why we're doing this funny thing. Um, what, we, what we do here is we have um, the, uh, or, or what we're trying to build toward is this type here, parity integer, which is just a, a pairing of some number with its parity. Is it even or odd? Um, and then we, the, the sort of the main event is to take, is to make a list of these from one to a hundred thousand and sum them all up together. And, and last week we analyzed performance. We're not actually going to look at performance this week. Instead, what we're going to look at is the fact that, um, well, last week we saw that when we used unbox types, we got better performance and that's because we have to allocate less, but that causes some, some trouble. And today we're trying to, we're going to unpack that trouble. Um, last week was all about sort of motivation. Today is about making it more convenient. Um, and we're going to unpack why we have that trouble and what we can do about it. The idea of an unboxed type is that when we represent that type, we don't use a box, right? So if we, if we think about it, there's not really a good way I can, I can scribble on, on, on Emacs here, but every, um, every boxed type and most Haskell types, all of the normal Haskell types that you're thinking about, those are all boxed types. All of these types are represented by a pointer. This is really, really convenient in Haskell. Uh, and the reason is, is that I'm gonna write a little function that has nothing to do with the rest of this, but it's convenient to write it. If I write this identity function, um, and that still compiles, this is actually a real function that's going to be run. If I call identity, it's an actual function that takes in an argument and returns it. Well, if it takes in an argument, and that means that there needs to be some agreement between the code that calls identity and identity itself for how it's going to receive that information. And then because it returns something, there needs to be a further agreement with whatever calls identity about how it's going to, how, I, how the caller is going to get this result back. Now, this function is really trivial, but it's, there still needs to be this agreement between the caller and the function. This agreement is called a calling convention. And a standard calling convention in a language like Haskell is to pass everything by pointer or by reference. Um, so that means that when we call identity, we're going to take the argument and we're going to put it somewhere in memory and we're going to take the address of that memory, what it has, sort of however many bytes it is from the beginning of memory. It's a bit of a naive description of it, but it's a pretty good one. Um, and and then we're going to put that in a register, right? A register is essentially some special variable deep inside the bowels of my hardware that can be used to transmit information from one place to another. So we're going to put um, the address of some datum uh, in a register and then jump to a piece of code that runs the identity function, right? So there's this, this identity function. It's very simple, but it's still going to be represented by some code that's running in my computer. And then that code, when it's done running, it's going to put the result uh, maybe in another register, maybe in the same register. That depends on this calling convention, and, and then return. The key thing here is that no matter what type I call identity on, the code has to perform the same sequence of actions. And that means that no matter what type it is, whether it's an int or a bool or a tree or a list, it has to perform the same actions. Now, these different bits of information, a bool really should only take one bit in memory. An int might take four bytes or eight bytes. Um, pointers might take eight bytes. Um, no matter what the data is, it has to be represented uniformly so that as this, um, as this, the, these registers work, as this calling convention unfolds, as the function gets called, um, we know what to do. 
That was a bit of a vague description, right? No matter what the type is, the actions have to remain the same. I can't sometimes move one bit and sometimes move eight bytes. So Haskell, among many other languages, chooses a uniform um, representation. Everything is represented by a pointer. And that means that no matter how many, pointer, how many uh, bytes really need to be used to represent some data, we, we always know that we're just going to be representing it by a pointer. So if I'm passing an int to identity, well, we're not really passing an int. We're passing a pointer to an int. Here, an unbox type dispenses with the pointer. And so that means that I can't call identity on a parity integer. Um, so we can see this. If I try calling my identity function on mook pi hash of, now there's a lot of sort of extra hashy things here. Um, let's say even five. Oh, that's, well, it didn't really matter, but that's very silly of me. So if I do this, now what am I going to get? I'm going to get some kind of error. Couldn't match a lifted type with an unlifted type. So this gets us into liftedness, but liftedness is not particularly mellifluent. So instead of using liftedness, we call it levity. So that's where the word levity comes from. L levity is closely re related to boxity. This whole video I've been talking about boxity, whether something is represented by a point or not. Levity is more about whether something can be lazy or not. So it's something that could be lazy, in other words, it might not be evaluated, that is represented by something that might be a thunk. A thunk is a Haskell thing that is not yet evaluated. The, the upshot here, though, is that if something might be a thunk, it really has to be boxed. And the way that we can tell a thunk from a non-thunk is by looking at one of the bits. Um, in, in, in any architecture, just about any architecture, any modern architecture, um, uh, pointers are always aligned. Um, so that might mean that if, if all pointers are eight bytes long, then the actual pointer value is going to be a multiple of eight. So we can, we can cheat a little bit if we might have something that's a pointer to an int, or maybe it's not really a pointer to an int, but it's a pointer to some code that will evaluate an int. Well, we can cheat, and now we can say that if it's a pointer to a code, we, we store it with a, uh, the last bit is a one. And I can look and say, ah, oh, there's a one there. That's not really a pointer. It must be one of these thunk things. And then my runtime system can, can treat that pointer specially because it's not really a pointer. Um, but that means that little sort of logic, that all hinged on the idea that we're, we're actually um, uh, representing anything that could be lazy by a pointer to begin with. Um, and that is indeed true in Haskell. So anything that's lifted, it's called um, lifted because it has an extra value uh, bottom. I don't know why that's tied to the word lifted. Um, perhaps I should look up that history. But that's what, we, that's what lifted means, um, is that it can, be, it can be a thunk. Anything that can be a thunk is also boxed. So that's how all of these little concepts are related. Um, OK, so let's return to this. So here we say can't match a lifted type with an unlifted type. More relevant to this video is cannot, couldn't match a boxed type with an unboxed type. But what, what it really means is, is that when I'm trying to instantiate this A, I'm trying to say, well, this A in my particular usage, where is it? Here. This particular A, I want it to be parity integer hash. Um, but we can't make A parity integer hash. So let's look a little bit closer at the type of identity here. Um, so it's really a for all A. But, but now if I say for all A, oh, um, uh, oh, we need to turn on explicit for all. Oh, now everything is OK. Oh, that's right, because I haven't written the bad code. Um, so we still get couldn't match a lifted type with an unlifted type. Uh, let's see, where's identity? Here it is. Um, here I've said that A is some type variable, and this is going to work for all A, but A has a kind. So we've already seen in some other videos about kinds. So what is the kind of A? Well, the kind of A is type. And so now, oh, not in scope, type. Eh, that's very annoying. Import data.kind, disrupting my whole flow here. Oh, illegal kind signature. Ugh. Um, uh, let's have kind signatures turned on. Can we get, yes, there we go. Now we've compiled, now we can put in the bad code and we get this same error. But now it's starting to make a little bit more sense. 
So here I've said that A has kind type. Parity integer has this other thing. Now what's going on here? What's, what's going on is that when I say A has kind type, well, that's just the type, this, this type thing here, spelled like this, is the type of lifted, or sorry, is the kind of lifted types. Um, so if I ask for what is the kind of int, well, it's type, right? GHCI spells type with a star here. What is the kind of bool? It's type. What is the kind of list of int? It's type. What is the kind of parity integer hash? Well, it's something else. What's going on is that here I specify the actual representation of a type in its kind. This is super useful because it means that I can't call identity using parity integer hash. The fact that I can't call identity, it might look a little bit annoying, but actually this is really useful. If I could call identity, all hell would break loose. Um, because identity is expecting to find a pointer, and then it's expecting to move that pointer maybe from one register to another so it can take an argument and then return it. But if I give it something other than a pointer, it's going to be doing the wrong thing. I want to catch this kind of error at compile time. I don't want to get a seg fault. And so the way that Haskell prevents me from calling identity on a parity integer hash is by using its kind system. And so here, I say parity integer hash has this much more glorious kind. So I can write that out. So I can use a type signature here. Uh, sorry, kind signature. So parity integer, whoops, integer hash. What does it have? It has kind type, tuple rep, lifted rep, lifted rep. It's a bit of a mouthful. Does it, is, does it work? Oh, I get all sorts of errors. Illegal standalone kind signature. So let's turn on standalone kind signatures. And then, oh, there's a bunch of things that aren't in scope, so import ghc.exts. Um, oh, now not in scope tuple rep. Oh, I needed data kinds. Data kinds. Ah, now what's going on? Illegal kind, did I need poly kinds? That really shouldn't need poly kinds. That looks like a little bit of a bug. But, okay, finally, aha, we have enough extensions. Um, so let's see. So what have I said here? So I've said that parity integer hash, well, it's a type of some sort, but it's not an ordinary type. It's a type with that's representation. It's a tuple of things, and both of the things in the tuple are themselves lifted. What this means at runtime, this particular kind for parity integer, is that it's going to be represented by two pointers, not just by one pointer, but by two pointers. Um, and that's because both parity and integer are themselves lifted. Um, just to see other things that we could have. So instead of just parity integer hash, let's look at kind of int hash. Oh, uh, not in scope int hash. Uh, should be. There we go, int hash. So the kind of int hash is type int rep. Um, and that means that normally, so, so just to show, kind of int is not int rep. Kind of int rep is star, which is a synonym for type. And type is itself, does this work? Oh, not in scope. If I ask for its info, oh, the pretty printer is foiling me. F print explicit. Runtime reps, that's probably still not enough. Ah, um, well, let's just dive into ghc.types and we can see the actual definition. I'm gonna use the fact that I have ghc sitting around here. Uh, libraries, ghc prim, ghc types. Where is it? Here it is. So this type thing, this is just a type where the representation is lifted. We have many other possible types. Um, so let's see, in, in, what we have here is, um, what, what do we have here? So this is type of lifted rep. Let's, what's the kind of type? This will be instructive. Kind of type, it takes a runtime rep and then returns a type. Let's not worry about that return value. That, that's gonna 
be more confusing than helpful. Um, but I want to look at runtime rep. Do we have runtime rep in here? We should. I think we have runtime rep in here. Yes, we do. So we have all of these different representations here. Uh, so here we have that it can be boxed rep of levity. So actually, where is lifted rep? Uh, lifted rep is really just boxed rep of lifted. Um, so let's see, going back down, uh, now I've lost it again. Where's runtime rep? Come on, here it is, uh, toward the bottom, okay. Um, so runtime rep is all of these different things. So it can be boxed, either lifted or unlifted. Um, it can be one of these primitive representations down here, or it can be tuple rep, it can be sum rep, it can be a vector. Um, but here we see that we have all of these different representations for data. And depending on the representation, now the, um, uh, the code generator that actually produces the assembly code uh, at the back end of GHC can use this representation to figure out how actually to move data around in registers and such. Let's return to our example over here. So here I'm saying that unlike this lifted rep that we use here in identity, parity integer has a much more elaborate representation, making it unsuitable for identity. What levity polymorphism is about is functions that are actually polymorphic in representation. So that's why I said earlier that levity polymorphism is actually a bit of a poor name. It should be representation polymorphism because we're going to see functions that can actually vary um, uh, depending on the representation. So that's a little unusual, right? I was just saying that a function, in order to, for us to produce the assembly code to actually manipulate uh, the registers correctly, we have to know the representation. Well, there are still some tricks up my sleeve around that. I think this has gone long enough, so those tricks up my sleeve I think are going to have to wait for a future week. Um, here what we've seen today is that we have this type thing, and this type thing allows us to specify different representations for different types. So parity integer hash can have a different representation from a normal type which has this lifted box representation. And we've seen a little bit of the variety of, of representations that we might have and why this is important. Now we'll make better use of this in a future video, I believe next week. Thanks very much for watching, bye.